In this video, we will demonstrate why the Koch curve does not have a tangent at any point on the curve. Well into the 19th century, mathematicians assumed that a continuous function always had a first derivative which could become undefined or infinitely large only at isolated points, and thus that a continuous curve always had tangents except at these isolated points. But they were wrong. In 1872, the German mathematician Karl Weierstrass gave an example of a continuous function defined with the two parameters a and b that was not differentiable at any value of x. Weierstrass's function, and many other such examples that came afterward, were described in terms of infinite series and formulas. But in 1904, the Swedish mathematician Helga von Koch described a continuous curve with no tangents that was constructed from elementary geometry using an infinite sequence of iterations. To construct the Koch curve, start with a line segment. Remove the middle third of the line segment and replace it with the two edges of an equilateral triangle. The same operation is now applied on each of these segments by removing the middle thirds and replacing them with two edges of the corresponding equilateral triangle. By repeating this process indefinitely, one obtains an infinite sequence of polygonal lines that will converge in the limit to the continuous Koch curve. Of course, all we can show here is just an approximation of this curve after a finite number of iterations. The following year after Koch's paper was published, the Italian mathematician Ernesto Cicero provided an alternative construction of the Koch curve based on isosceles triangles. We will use his construction to show why the Koch curve has no tangent at any point on the curve. Cesaro's construction begins with an isosceles triangle T0 having angles of 30 and 120 degrees. This triangle can be subdivided into three smaller triangles, an equilateral triangle, and two isosceles triangles that are similar to T0. Remove the equilateral triangle to produce the image T1. Note that all of the vertices in triangle T0 are also vertices of triangles in the set T1. Also notice that the bottom boundary of T1 is the polygonal line from the first iteration of the Koch construction. Now the process is repeated indefinitely. At each iteration, each isosceles triangle is divided into three pieces, and then the equilateral triangle is removed, so the number of triangles will double. Notice also how the polygonal lines from the Koch construction appear along the bottom boundary of the sets Tn. All of the vertices of the triangles in Tn will also be vertices of the new triangles in the set Tn plus 1. In addition, both the length of the base and the area of the triangles in Tn will decrease towards zero as the number of iterations increases. This construction generates a decreasing sequence of connected and compact subsets. The actual limit of this sequence is the intersection of all the sets in the sequence, and this connected and compact set is the Koch curve. And because the Koch curve is equal to this intersection, the curve will be contained in every set Tn. If we now zoom in on one of those sets, we can see the many smaller isosceles triangles that make up the figure. And if we peek inside the set, what will be revealed is the Koch curve. In fact, because each of the isosceles triangles is similar to the original triangle T0, the self-similarity in the construction means that each individual triangle will contain a copy of the entire Koch curve, scaled by a suitable factor. Perhaps it is not surprising, therefore, that no matter how far we zoom into the Koch curve, the curve will never straighten out to approach a tangent line. Let's see how we can make that idea more precise to show why there is no point on the Koch curve that has a tangent but we first need to remember what having a tangent means about a curve. Suppose a continuous curve in the plane has a tangent at a point P. Then we know that the secant lines from P to other points on the curve will converge to that tangent line as those points move closer and closer to point P. So if there is a tangent at the point P, then any two points on the curve on the same side of P that are sufficiently close to P will form secant lines that are very close to the tangent line, and in particular, close to each other. Therefore, the angle between those secant lines will be small. However, we will show that this can never happen at any point on the Koch curve. 
Now suppose P is a point on the Koch curve. Let delta be an arbitrarily small positive number. Then there is a sufficiently large K such that P is in one of the isosceles triangles from the set TK for which the length of the base of the triangle is less than delta. Let's zoom into this particular triangle that contains the point P. We will consider three cases about the location of point P in this triangle. At the next iteration, the middle equilateral triangle would be removed, leaving two isosceles triangles. In the first case shown here, P is in the left triangle. The vertices of these two isosceles triangles are all points on the Koch curve since the vertices belong to every set T in in the construction of the Koch curve. Therefore, the line segments PC and PE are parts of two secant lines at point P for the Koch curve. Points C and E are both on the Koch curve to the right side of the point P since they are in the right isosceles triangle. Now consider the triangle formed by adding the segment CE. Let the angles at the three vertices be denoted by alpha, beta, and theta. The angle alpha will have a value between 60 degrees and 90 degrees. The angle beta will have a value between 0 degrees and 60 degrees. Adding these two inequalities shows that alpha plus beta has a value between 60 degrees and 150 degrees. But the sum of all three angles is 180 degrees, so angle theta must be greater than or equal to 30 degrees. Now suppose the point P was in the right triangle. Then the same argument as before would show that the angle theta between the secant lines containing the segments PC and PD would also be greater than or equal to 30 degrees. In this case, the points C and D are both on the Koch curve to the left side of the point P since they are in the left isosceles triangle. The last case is if point P is the same as vertex C. In this case, the angle theta between the secant lines containing the segments P, A, and P, D would be exactly 30 degrees. Here the points A and D are both on the Koch curve to the left side of the point P since P is at the transition of the curve from the left triangle to the right triangle. Now if the Koch curve had a tangent at P, then we know that there would be a sufficiently small delta such that any two points on the curve within a distance delta from P and on the same side of P would form secant lines that are very close to each other with a small angle between them. But as we just saw, for any delta, no matter how small, there are always at least two points on the Koch curve that are on the same side of P and for which the angle between the two secant lines for those points is at least 30 degrees. Therefore, there cannot be a tangent at the point P. And since P was an arbitrary point on the Koch curve, this shows that there are actually no points anywhere on the Koch curve that have a tangent. 